One of my friends um, got a background in the fitness industry many, many moons ago and a few extra kilos ago as well. I was in the fitness industry and, and I still have many good close friends and one of my close friends and unfortunately the, the new age movement and a spirituality, uh, a, 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 a fake spirituality has infiltrated large aspects of the fitness industry, health and fitness industry. And um, <clears throat> one of my friends, good friends, posted this thought this week on Facebook and, and they said that there is no past, there is no future, there is only the present moment. And the idea of that, and this is a fairly common idea amongst uh, motivational speakers and, 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 uh, and life coaches at the moment, is this idea of mindfulness or this idea of being present in the moment. And, and it's not without merit, and it, it, is, it is got an element of truth in it. And the element of truth in it, ironically, is what's been taken from God's truth. But unfortunately, it's been distorted somewhat to suit the Eastern mysticism that they want to uh, be answerable to because there is no answer in Eastern mysticism. So it gives humanity the freedom to be whatever they want. There is no past, there's no future, there's only the present moment. So do whatever you want, do whatever you feel. Live now. But faith has a much of a different story that speaks to us. <clears throat> faith does not shy back from the fact that many of us have broken pasts. And faith doesn't ignore that. Faith doesn't ignore that our tomorrows might look quite dark. Faith doesn't ignore that. The story of God that he invites us into is that I want to be present in your past in order so that I can live with you today so that I can bless your future tomorrow. Life with God speaks to every single moment of our life past, present, and future. The journey never stops with God. The invitation is what the Bible would refer to as an olam. Olam is the word that we would translate into eternity, that we're actually invited into eternity with God. The word picture for olam in the Old Testament is, is a horizon point. You never reach the horizon. You could journey as long as you like to the horizon. But you will never reach the horizon. It is an eternal horizon that we journey toward in God. It's an eternal mindset that we live with. We don't live for today. We live for eternity. Eternity has been birthed into our hearts. C.S. Lewis said, if, if there is nothing in this world that satisfies me, the only logical conclusion I can reach is that I was not made for this world. We live with eternity in our minds, in our hearts. It's one of the gifts that has been breathed into us in our Imago day. And when it comes to the anointing, the anointing is part of God's supernatural endowment to live the life that we've been designed to live with Him and in Him, gifted to us through Christ Jesus so that we can actually attain by grace and favour the power necessary to live that way. The anointing in and of itself is very hard to define. In a biblical definition, it is simply a, a, a setting apart of the work unto God. And that's probably the, the greatest working definition. Yet we also know experientially and through church history that actually, and biblically, that, that the anointing, the supernatural empowerment of God through His grace and favour would come upon people. That the Spirit of God would come upon Isaiah. The Spirit of God would come upon Gideon. And they would be supernaturally empowered to fulfill the work and the plans and the will of God in that moment. That not only are they set apart for the work of God, but the anointing comes upon in order to fulfill the work of God. Likewise, in the life of a believer, faith is not just an adherence to ordinances and statutes and, and beliefs and creeds. The anointing the anointed life of a believer is not only that we are set apart through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but yet we are empowered by His grace to actually do the work of the ministry as well, to bring heaven to earth, to establish His kingdom here in our worlds, in the unique calling and, and, and work that He's called us to. One of the stories that 
that, that, that alludes to an eternal mindset of the anointing is the story of Joseph. And maybe you're new to Christianity and you're not completely familiar with the story of Joseph. Joseph uh, lived in the Old Testament and uh, he, was, he was one of Jacob's sons. Jacob was one of the, what we call the patriarchs. Abraham was, was called to start a nation. He had a son, Isaac. Isaac had a son, Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. And in the 12 sons, that's where we get the 12 tribes of Israel. One of those sons was Joseph. And, and Joseph was actually sold into slavery, he ended up living in Egypt. And while living in Egypt and his life is in a complete mess and disarray, you couldn't get a more broken life than Joseph. You couldn't get a more betrayed person than Joseph, sold out by his own family, betrayed by his own employer, put into prison under false accusation. You couldn't get a more broken life than Joseph, yet that was the very story. That was the very person, that was the very circumstance that God used for his glory, not only to save Israel and, and all, of, all of Jacob's sons and Joseph's brothers, but also to save the whole world. What is it with God that uses brokenness to bring wholeness? It's in his character, it's in his nature. And one of the aspects of, of God's ability to do that is that he uses the anointing on someone's life that, that he calls them, separates them, then empowers them so that they can be a demonstration of his glory. And it's a practice that he has not stopped. It's a practice that he didn't cease. You are now. God's instrument of peace on this earth. Peace is a weapon in God's hand. Wholeness is one of the tools of his kingdom. Restoration is his, is his artwork and tapestry that, that he loves to display. And he uses broken vessels like you and I. And he breathes and puts into the Spirit of God, through the Spirit of God, an anointing into your life and into your hands. Let's have a look at the beginning of Joseph's story in Genesis 37. It says this, verse 1. Genesis 37, verse 1. It says, Now Jacob dwelt in the land where he, his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhar and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I've dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. And so he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. There is a myriad of, of different narratives and thoughts and theological concepts that is interwoven throughout that whole passage. But the one that I want to stick to and cling to this morning and by and large focus on is, is very Andrew Staggs-esque in its title. Andrew Staggs preached here last week and you know that he loves, he loves a good alliteration. He loves a good old Pentecostal sermon title. So I've actually I've gone down that, that path this morning of the Dean... And I've called this morning, the anointing will make way for your appointing. Yeah. That's a tribute to the dean. All right. 
Your anointing will make way to your appointing. Joseph, he has a dream. He has a dream of his appointing. What he didn't quite have a glimpse into was what the journey would be under the anointing. And many of us have got a dream in God. We've got a vision. We've got a prophetic word. We've got a promise. We've got a, we've got a glimpse into what God has prepared us for. But what some of us at times in our faith journey misunderstand or, or misappropriate is the idea that actually it's the anointing that makes way for the appointing. We think it's a, it's a done deal, and it is. We think it's a, it's a sure thing, and it is. You're not wrong in that. Don't, don't change your thoughts on that. But understand that everything in God is yes and amen in Christ Jesus, yet it is also a journey that we walk through because God is interested more in who you are becoming in Him than what you can do for Him. He doesn't need your help. He just loves to use you. He just loves to fashion you into tools and weapons of his glory and his peace and his, his faithfulness. He doesn't, he doesn't need your lending hand. He just wants you to be in his hand while he guides you. And so God's, God's using his anointing in your triumphs as well as, as, well as your tragedies because you've got a date with destiny. And that is the, the finished work that you've been made even before the foundations of this world were even laid. You're a finished product. God didn't start with you at the beginning and be like, well, I wonder how this is going to work out. And then halfway along your journey, when you're in a pit or a prison like Joseph is about to find him in, God's not up in heaven going, oh, dear Lord Jesus, I did not see that coming. No, God starts at the end. And He's like, I've made you to be a demonstration of my goodness and my glory and my faithfulness. I'm going to use you in ways that are, going to, that are going to speak my praise right across the nations. I'm going to use you so that when people see you, they see the goodness of God. I'm going to use you as a weapon against the forces of darkness in this planet. I'm going to use you as a spiritual weapon in my hands to establish my kingdom. An eternal display of my manifold wisdom. And then he works his way backwards. And he's like, well, that's going to be a fun journey. Oh, I can't believe he did that. And then he gets all the way back to the beginning. And he's like, this is going to be an epic journey. And I'm going to enjoy it the whole way. And so Joseph here has got a glimpse of his, uh, his appointing. He, he just doesn't have any idea of his anointing. See, the anointing is not only a, 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 a grace and a favor it is, it is also the empowerment for you to make it through the journey. It's an empowerment to make it through the journey. And once again, if you're not familiar with the story of Joseph, we haven't got time to read it, but you, you, in, the, in the following verses, his brothers take this 17-year-old kid who's telling his whole family about his appointing in God. Hey, I'm going to be a prophet to the nations. I'm going to run the biggest multinational business. God has seen it in my life. I've, I, I just know I'm going to be, I'm going to be something. I'm going to be significant. I'm going to be awesome. You should, you should see me, guys. God has made me to be epic. And he has. There's only two groups of people you never tell about the epicness that God has breathed into you. One is your own family. The other is a bunch of Aussies. Never tell Aussies that you're going to be great. And Joseph, he didn't have any Aussies to bring him down, but, but he certainly had some brothers that were like, come here, squirt. And they put him in a pit and sold him to the next band of slave traders that were coming down the road. Imagine the heartbreak that Joseph had to live with. Imagine the questions. Like instantaneously while he's sitting there in a, in, in a dark pit, helpless, can't get out. Imagine the questions to God. God, you said. God, your word said. God, your promise to me was. 
God, you, you gave me a dream. And then, and then to his surprise, things don't get actually better. They, they get worse. Not only does he go from a pit, but he gets sold to a, to a house in Egypt with a guy who runs it called Potiphar, Potiphar's house. And then he gets accused of something that he didn't do and ends up in prison. He gets out of the pit only to get into a prison. Sometimes life, you live long enough, life will give you a pit and a prison. Sometimes life will give you a pit in a prison. <laughs> and, and, and you know what? It, it doesn't matter what age. You, you could get this young. Joseph got his pit when he was young. So we, we, as, we as older people, I'm 40 now, I can say that. We as older people, we can't look at the young people and be like, you got no idea about life. you got no idea how, how tough life can be. No, they, they, they possibly can and, and probably do. And, and likewise, us younger generations, I'm 40, I can say that. <laughs> we can't look at those who have gone before and, and, and be like, well, you got, you got no idea how tough life is today. Or how, how, how bad the world is. You, you got it all together. Okay, boomer. Like, you got, you got no idea. No, they do. They've, they've gone around the block a couple of times. And, and, and life just has a way of getting you in the pit and the prison. But what we need to remember, and, and what this original Facebook post that I talked about this morning, about there being no past, no future, only a present, that, that is totally irrelevant to actually the journey of life, is that faith in God and the story that Jesus has breathed into our lives speaks to our past that may have a pit, may have a prison. It speaks to our future, which may have a pit and may have a prison in it because it always speaks to the anointing of our today in order to empower us into the palace that God has designed for us to live in. The anointing is the empowerment for your appointing. And it's, it's actually regardless where you are at because faith speaks a bigger story than your circumstance. Faithfulness of God will always be a louder declaration in the universe than your unique moment of tragedy. And as tough as that is to hear at times, it's also comforting. But actually, I'm not the first person to live a broken life. I'm not the first person to find myself in a prison. I'm not the first person that needs the restoration of Jesus Christ to come to my life. I'm not the first person that God has had to get the pieces of their life and knit them back together. And matter of fact, if you look at the stories of the Bible, most of them, and I mean most of them, involve a broken person. Who better demonstrates the faithfulness of God than King David? He sings about it and writes about it through the Psalms and lives a life demonstrating the faithfulness of God. Yet David himself was an unfaithful philanderer who murdered in order for him to actually get the woman that he wants. That's messed up. That's broken. Ended up in losing his own son. Multiple sons, actually, but that unique situation literally lost his own son because of his own actions. Yet God took that broken life and then used it as a demonstration, one of the greatest demonstrations in the Bible around the faithfulness of God. The Bible is littered with examples of that. Let's have a look at Joseph's stories here. In verse chapter 39, if we jump over a couple of chapters, in verse 3 and verse 23, we see that, that Joseph prospered in the pit and the prison. It's possible for you to prosper where you're at. Don't wait for you to get out of prison before you start prospering. Prosper now. Don't wait for someone to get you out of that pit. Don't wait for God to get you out of that pit. That pit may very well be the very thing that God uses for you to prosper. So you may as well start prospering now. Don't put a pregnant pause on your prospering. Prosper now. In verse 3 of chapter 39, it says, And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. That's in part of his house. And in verse 23, it says, The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Prosper now. Because it's never your performance that speaks to your prosperity. It's always the faithfulness and the grace and the favor on your life. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. You've got to marry faith with diligence. Faith never operates in a vacuum. It always operates with the, with the unanimous 
and synonymous relationship of diligence. Be diligent with your faith. On the one hand, we believe in the miraculous of God. On the other hand, if you are more diligent, you'd probably need less miracles. On, on, on the one hand, God is supernaturally empowered to move on your behalf and to, to establish and speak heaven into your world. But on the other hand, He's giving you the tools of diligence and faith and stewardship and supernatural ability through Holy Spirit giftings for you to get busy and working in the kingdom in order for you to bring heaven to earth. you got to marry faith with diligence. God wants you to prosper But you've also got to set your hand at work with the favour and the grace that's on your life. God wants you to be living in the palace, but but He also wants you to be the the steward that can resource heaven's bank accounts. Like, I I want my son to prosper, but I tell you what, I'm not writing him a $1,000 check this morning because he's eight. No, he actually turned nine. This week, actually, turned nine this week. You know what a nine-year-old's going to do with $1,000? I ain't giving him that. I'm going to need some diligence before I can entrust him with the empowerment of my resource. Faith needs to marry diligence. Now, we've got to believe in the supernatural empowerment of heaven, no doubt. But we've also got to see ourselves as the diligent stewards that are resourced with it. Always marry diligence and, and faith together. Grace, we see in verse 4, in verse 4 of 39, it says, So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Found favor and served him. Then he made him overseer of the house and all that he had put under his authority. And all that he had, he put under his authority. Verse 21 and 23, about the prison now as well. So that, that was part of his house. Now this is the prison. He says, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. And gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Verse 23, the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority. Joseph is in prison and nobody's checking up on his work. Why? Because there's favor of God in his life. There's a favor on you. There is a favor that you walk with as a child of the kingdom of God. Or a child of of, of heaven. There's just a supernatural favor on your life. But what do you do with that favor? There needs to be an action to that favor because it's a supernaturally grace-empowered favor that comes upon you so that you can establish all that God wants you to do. Once again, we are marrying the fact that we live a supernatural encounter, relationship with God and the supernatural, but that supernatural has to invade our everyday. We've got to stop separating the God of the miraculous and the God of the everyday. It's the same God. And so faith speaks to our past, our present, and our future. One of Joseph's main giftings was administration. In verse 5, it says this, So it was from that time that he made him overseer of that house, this is Potiphar again, and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. And in verse 22, it, talking about the prison, it says, and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison, whatever they did there, it was his doing. Joseph was an incredible administrator. And, and what I find about incredible of his life is that he's got incredible favor, he's got incredible blessing, he's got an incredible appointing. Yet the journey of his life included incredible tragedy, betrayal triumph and through it all through it all there was a steadfast commitment to appropriate the grace and the favor on his life and deliver it for the ministry of what God wanted to do in the earth and and we ourselves our faith journey surely should be the same 
we, we've all got different stories. There's, there's a different story in every single seat in this auditorium this morning. And, and in every one of those stories, there's going to be some ingredients of brokenness in there. There's going to be some ingredients of triumph in there. There's going to be some ingredients of, of, of amazing stories of testimony. There's also going to be some amazing stories where God just didn't come through the way you thought that he was going to come through. There, there is going to be some incredible pits in this auditorium that if, 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 if you were told about the pits that people had to get out of, They'd make your eyes water. And, and, and there may even be some people that are literally sitting in a prison right now this morning. You're trying to be here. You're trying to worship. You're trying to lift up your hands. You're trying to clap. You're trying to sing about the goodness of God. But the prison of your circumstance right now is just, it, it, it's just so suffocating and, and, and it's just so encapsulating and it's, it, it's just all around you. But the way in which we live faith is, is not just from, uh, uh, from an only in this moment perspective, but it's from an eternity perspective because we know that we have an appointing, and we know that the anointing is what we need to get through each of these moments because we are headed towards an eternal appointing in Christ of an heavenly demonstration of His goodness and glory. And so when, when, we, when we look at the overall aspects of our life, even that isn't good enough. God is good. What, according to my life? Maybe, maybe not, but it's the wrong measure. God is good according to the eternal demonstration of His goodness and glory through you. Even in your life, it, it's still not the right measure of the goodness of God. You have to look across the expanse of eternity, the olam of God, the eternal faithfulness of God. And then you can start to peer into the mystery of what God is fashioning you into. Let's ground this in a practical application. What, what am I trying to say this morning? Well, you, 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 have, an, you have an appointing. Yeah, you have an appointing. And the anointing is, is, is what's going to get you to where God has promised to get you. Joseph, in the end, the end of the story is that Joseph ended up uh, get, being promoted from the prison, ended up becoming the prime minister of the nation, the second most powerful person in the whole world and, and fortunate for not only Israel but also for the whole world because they were about to go through a severe famine and because of his diligence and faith in God and his supernatural empowerment to administer through his giftings that he received from God, uh, he was able to not only bring salvation to Israel but also salvation to the whole world. The whole world was saved because of that man, Joseph. And upon a supernatural deeper level, Joseph is a picture of Christ. That actually through Christ's obedience and the shame and the crucifixion and the prison that he was sent to, that he also brought salvation to Israel, his brothers, and also to the whole world, you and I. And so Joseph is, through his obedience and faith, bringing salvation to the world. Jesus, through his obedience and faith, brings salvation to the whole world. And now you and I are joining Christ's story that through our faith and obedience, we now co-labor with Christ to bring salvation to the whole world. And sometimes you may be in a pit, sometimes you may be in a prison, but understand that it's, it's the anointing of Christ in you that is the hope of glory for your appointing. And it finishes out Joseph's story here in Genesis 47 or, or one of the concluding verses. It actually keeps going all the way to chapter 50. But one of the concluding vo uh, verses I want to land on in Genesis 47, 27, it says, So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions there and grew and multiplied exceedingly. A, a, a couple of things. Let, let's speak individually first. Your hidden years will make way for open blessing. Your hidden years make way for open blessing. Don't despise the hidden years. Learn to embrace the pit and the prisons of your life. They're actually what's preparing you for the open blessing that God is, is wanting to walk you into. David, before he was king of Israel, was hidden in a back paddock, being faithful to the few sheep that he had to look after. And it was those hidden years that prepared him for his Goliath. He'd already taken out a lion. He'd already taken out a bear. He'd already protected the sheep in the paddock before he decided that God needed him to look after the sheep of Israel from, 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 the, from the danger of Goliath. But it was those hidden years that prepared him for the open blessing. There are years that you feel God has hidden you 
There are years that you feel God has hid from you, but it's those hidden years that are preparing you for your open blessing. That when you get through this valley of the shadow of death, that you will get to the other side and, and you'll see that God has actually been there the whole time. And now your testimony is about the goodness and the faithfulness of God. You might not have spoken about that yesterday, but now that you can see from God's perspective and get the helicopter view of what He was trying to do, those hidden years are now a years of gratefulness in your heart because without those hidden years, without those trials, without that testimony, you would be in no shape or form to be able to deliver everything that God has prepared you to deliver in that now moment. The hidden years make way for the open blessing. But here's the other thing that, you know, really gr grates us in Western spirituality is that actually your journey isn't only about you. That actually Joseph's pit in prison was not only preparation for him to reach the palace, it was also preparation for Israel to be saved. It was also preparation for Egypt and the world to be saved. It's like, you know, we, we, we rhyme back to Joseph at 17 and God's giving you a dream. God, well, God, you've made me, Lord, to be a successful businessman and I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be prosperous and I'm gonna have amazing wealth. Yes, but it's not just about you. It's about how you can steward that wealth into the kingdom of God so that others can be saved. Well, God, you, you gave me a great anointing to raise an amazing family and, and my ministry is in the home and, 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 and I just want to spend time with my kids and grow them and, and, and just have an amazing family holidays and, and just a beautiful, peaceful home and environment. Yeah, and you're anointed for that because you've been appointed to raise children in the kingdom of God who contribute to this nation and contribute to the body of Christ your blessing and your anointing isn't just about you and your family. Your blessing and your anointing is about bringing salvation to others. What are you anointed for? What, what is your anointing? Whatever it is, it's going to make way for your appointing. Well, well I'm, I'm, I'm really good at... I'm really good at, at, at accounting. Okay, be good at accounting and, and, and be, the, be the solution to help other organizations to, to establish the kingdom of God and focus on what they need to do. And while you're looking after the books, they can do what they need to do because it's not your gifting, your anointing isn't about you. It's about bringing salvation to others. Faith not only speaks to my yesterday, today and my tomorrow, it also speaks to broader things than just me in my life. Faith makes me see from an eternal perspective. And guess what? I'm not the center of the universe. Hot tip, neither are you. Jesus is. And Jesus has a plan to bring salvation to everyone and He wants to use you. Let, let me ground this even more. What are you saying? Well, I think we've got to walk two sides of the line here. On the one hand, Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, lay, let us lay aside every weight. You're in a race of faith. You, it's not about you. You're in a race of faith. And the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And, and as much as we want to champion that verse, let's walk that. But let's walk this as well. Come to me, all those who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We've we got, we got to walk with both of those in mind. We've got to realize, hey, I'm empowered. Come to me, all of all of you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. I'll give you grace. I'll give you favor. I'll give you what you need. You don't need to do this in your own strength. I'll be your empowerment. I'll be your anointing. I'll be the one who, 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 who sets you apart and, and, and gives you everything that you're gonna need to step into what I've planned for you. Why? Because you've got a race to run. But don't get so sidetracked over here that you're like, man, I just gotta beat my body. I just gotta like, I gotta train, I gotta do this, I gotta strive, I gotta, I gotta run, I gotta get up and train. Like, don't get so focused on that. You gotta get the rest, 
the empowerment, the grace and the favor. Why? Because you've got a race to run. Don't get so comfy over here though. What are you doing? I'm, just, I'm, I'm in a season of rest. Bro, you've been in that season for seven years. And we've had like 48 volunteers go through burnout while you're in a season of rest. Can that season of rest come to an end anytime soon? Like there's actually work to do. Yeah, I'm just resting in God. Okay, cool. Rest in God so that you can get the empowerment to run your race. You've got to do both. What, what does this look like? It looks like Psalm 23. It looks like Psalm 23. The trouble with Psalm 23, Jeremiah 29, Psalm 91, John 3, 16, the problems with these scriptures is that they're so familiar, they start losing their power in our life. The old adage, familiarity breeds contempt. But let's have a look at the anointing in practice. Let's let the power of Psalm 23 come alive in us again this morning. This is kingdom living. This is rest and running our race. Let's read it together. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Notice those two sentences are structurally linked to each other. Don't separate them. You can't just live in the, I shall not want. I'm just resting in God's grace, baby. Yeah. No, you've got a race to run and the Lord is your shepherd. You better follow him. The Lord is my shepherd. I run the race of faith. I'm going to follow Him, be obedient to Him, follow my shepherd's voice. And when I do that, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. I, I, I like that. He like, makes me lie down in green pastures. I like a bit of green pastures. I like that. I particularly like grass-fed steak. Come on, Jesus, let's get some grass-fed steak. But we also got to follow Him to the still waters. We're like, God, life is a torrent right now. It's a, it's a, oh, I can't even hear you because I've got Niagara Falls next to me. It's like it's loud and it's chaotic. And He's like, yeah, because you're not following me to the still waters. You're off doing your own journey. You, you, you want to lie down next to still waters in green pastures? Well, then then you better be following Him where He's leading you to the still waters. Uh, I'm going to pick this up a little bit. You, you get the picture now, right? Let's, let, I'm going to let you apply the rest to that same pattern. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Restoration, but He leads you in righteousness. For His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table. Come on, this is speaking my language now. Prepare a table. What have we got? Jesus, on Australia Day, I had a meat platter. And it was like, it had lamb on there. I had steak on there. I had marinated chicken on there. I had a, I had a sausage. It was amazing. Prepare a table. And Jesus is like, yeah, just hang up in a sec. I haven't finished that sentence yet. It's in the presence of your enemies. You're running a race. You're in a battle. Faith is endurance as much as it is supernatural. We, we've got to walk both sides there. And I'm going to finish on this. You anoint my head with oil. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We've got to understand that the anointing for our appointing comes from Christ alone. You are supernaturally gifted. You are talented. You have abilities that, that make some of us super jealous in this room, no doubt. We look up at you and we admire you. But at the end of the day, it's Christ, the good shepherd, that anoints our head with oil. It's His anointing, Christ's anointing in me that is preparing me to walk in everything that He has authored for me and finished for me, perfected for me, it's in Christ. So this year, 24, let's this be a year of, of Psalm 23 where we follow the Good Shepherd. We run that good race of faith, but we do it sitting beside still waters, coming to Him who gives rest for our weary souls, doing it under the grace and the favour 
but also matching it with the diligence of being servants of Jesus Christ. Come on, let's stand in the presence of the Lord. And, and right now, just those leaders that I've asked to come and help anoint the church this morning, if you could just come and get your oil ready. It's over there on the front row. Cal, to Neil. We're going to get leaders up the front here. If you've got kids in kids ministry and, and you want them to be anointed with you as a family, please feel free to go get your children right now. The kids, the kids team know that they will release the children to you. Not all the children, only if you go get them. So if you want them here, you need to go get them. But we're going to anoint you with Christ's anointing this morning. It's, it's, it's an anointing of rest. It's an anointing of favour. It's an anointing of empowerment. Why? Because you have an appointing in Christ Jesus. You got an appointing in eternity. And this anointing, it speaks louder than your past. It declares louder than your future. It shapes your future. It moulds your future to the anointing of Jesus Christ. Leaders, if you could just come out the front here. You guys, if you guys make a line out the front here, people can come. What we're going to do when you're ready, you don't have to do this, but when you're ready, I want you to come to the front because this is the time we just say, God, this is your year. I thank you for the anointing of Jesus in my life. And I dedicate this year to you. I'm going to run the race of faith in servants, service and, 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 and diligence to your cause. But I'm not gonna do it in my own strength, God. I need your anointing. I need the supernatural empowerment of grace in my life. So let's pray together. God, Lord, we commit this year to you. We declare 2024 to be the year of the Lord. We declare 2024 to be a tool in the hands of our God to demonstrate His goodness and His glory. And we submit our lives one more time. We do it again and again and again in surrender to the Lord. And we say, Jesus, if you can use me one more time, use me one more time, God. I am Yours, I am in Your hands. It's Your anointing, God, it's Your grace. I can't move one more step without Your presence. God, I know I have an appointing in You, but God, I need Your anointing in my life. I need, Lord, the God endowment of power of Your presence in my every moment, God. Lord, I thank You, Lord, that You're not far off, but You're in the everyday. You're in the every facet of my life. And so use me one more time. We dedicate this year to You. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen.